you know, good uh, morning, afternoon, evening, whatever it is in your part of the world. Um, and uh, I will uh, like to talk today about uh, uh, scientific modeling and, and lab automation. And is uh, and there will be programming languages as well in this talk, so it's not uh, that far from the topics that were mentioned before. Um, so first, a little bit of outline. I will uh, begin by describing a little bit the scientific method, just as a summary, and the fact that eventually we want to automate it. Uh, then I will talk about uh, modeling, uh, in particular about models that know nothing about protocols, and I will focus on chemical reaction networks. And then conversely, I will talk about uh, lab protocols that know nothing about models, and I will describe uh, digital microfluidics in particular. And through the, through the talk, I will talk about integrating all these different components of, uh, of this endeavor of trying to understand how the physical world actually works. And I will demonstrate uh, my new app called Kimika, which uh, you can find in all the app stores. I will give you some, some demos of that as well. Um, so let's start uh, with um, the scientific method. So in, in the old days, uh, this, is the, uh, this is the Wikipedia uh, diagram for the scientific method. Uh, as you can see, it's a, it's a circular process that go from making observations, thinking of interesting questions, uh, formulating hypotheses, uh, developing predictions, uh, gathering data, and developing theories. And uh, this, uh, this cycle, uh, which is still what we, we go through most, more or less today, uh, well, in the old days, it was done by a single person who would make the observations, uh, uh, think in, in the questions, uh, do the experiments, and then publish. So all, all by, by a single person, this is the typical you know, Renaissance model of scientific progress. Uh, one, one person could do the whole thing. Now, more, more recently, um, in the in current times, uh, the unit of scientific uh, uh, investigation is no longer a single person, but typically it's, it's a whole lab, which could be you know, uh, uh, 30 people for 30 years investigating some very specific aspect of maybe a protein or something like that. Uh, we're still going through the same cycle, but now there's a lot of uh, uh, more sophistication. There's a lot of uh, also some, some automation, some, some mechanization, of course, computers uh, uh, come into play all over the place. But the problem here is that uh, this model is not uh, sufficient because uh, uh, to investigate one protein, you know, completely, it's very easy that there will be some peop some lab that will spend 30 years so just investigating one protein. And humans, we humans have at least uh, 20, 50,000 proteins. So this model of investigation clearly does not scale up. If you want to understand the whole, like the whole thing, like what happens in a, in a single cell. Um, so um, what we want to do to uh, you know move up from from this kind of situation is to automate as much as possible uh, so that uh, uh, not only the, uh, the experiments, but also possibly even the, uh, the, the formulation of the or scientific hypothesis and, and the verification of the hypothesis can be done automatically. And there are examples of all these kinds of activities here and there, and not, not a fully integrated uh, system. And of course, it would be extremely hard to automate the development of new general theories. That's what you know, smart people do. Uh, but, but at least in this mall, we can begin to, to go around this loop in a very more or less automated way. So in, in the future, we want the unit of scientific investigation to be a program, a program that automatically does the whole thing. So it, this is a joke, but basically, you know, while through predict and falsify, that is scientific, scientific cycle. Uh, and so we want to automate this, uh, this cycle, this loop as much as possible. Now, the, um, as I said, the automating the inventing new theory is very difficult, but there is an inner loop, which uh, once you have a pretty much a theory, more or less, you think what you know what you're doing, then you go into the lab and you iteratively investigate that particular theory, generating variations of experiments to see what, what changes and what not, what doesn't change. So there is an inner loop that is uh, fairly feasible to automate even, even currently. Uh, and this inner loop consists of uh, models um, that describe maybe some equations that describe some physical system, uh, a protocol to, uh, to uh, investigate the, the model in a, in, a, in a lab or in a, physical, in a physical environment. And then there's the system itself you're investigating. Uh, and the problem is that uh, all these three things have problems. Uh, the model uh, usually today is a typically poorly maintained MATLAB script. So it's not so much a set of equations written in stone, it's an evolving script written in some uh, 
uh, algebraic language that you have to figure out what it you know, what it does. Um, the protocols is uh, some sequence of steps that people do in the lab, and those are it's difficult to uh, very accurately characterize what the steps actually are and, and reproduce them precisely. And the system themselves, especially in biology, they are they are very uh, variable. You cannot even set them at the same initial conditions every time. Uh, and so it's, it's very difficult to investigate these systems also because of, of this problem. So because of all these uh, kind of uncertainties in models, protocols, and systems, there's currently a real crisis in biology. You can go look, read this uh, uh, Nature article uh, where it explains that basically experiments, at least in biology, basically even important ones, they're done once and then never again. So they're not actually reproduced. And when people try to reproduce them, you usually run into problems. So this is not what uh, the scientific progress, you know, not, this is not the way it should work. Uh, you should be able to reproduce your experiments. So uh, we would like in the, in the future to uh, use automation to improve the situation and make all these things more reliable. Uh, so the models, we would like them to be an ambiguous mathematical description. This is a, the, the realms of computational biology where they try to system, systematize the expression of, of models. Um, with the protocols to be standardized and uh, uh, using engineered parts and procedures. This is the real non synthetic biology. We'll try to standardize uh, uh, the components that come into, um, uh, they come into interaction. Um, uh, the system would like them to be what characterized biological order, organism. So this is system biology where they try to make foundries of uh, standardized biological components that you can, you can compose. Um, and, and all these arcs, falsification, verification, observation, also this should be automated as much as possible. Um, uh, and there is a life cycle, you know, there are life cycles, questions like how do you manage all this process and how do you keep, keep up with versions and so on. So, uh, so all this is what uh, you know, we, we hope we will be doing in the future. And what I want to concentrate uh, on today is to look at this kind of inner cycle in a very sp specific situation where we look at uh, chemical models, chemical reaction models to be concrete. And so the, the models are going to be chemical, uh, chemical reaction systems. The, uh, the protocols are going to be, uh, uh, for reason you will see later, they're going to be DNA uh, protocols that manipulate DNA strands. And, the, uh, <clears throat> and we want to achieve this integration between models and, and lab protocols through what I will describe as molecular programming. So let's start with the uh, chemical uh, chemical models. So why are chemical reactions interesting? Uh, so these are things like uh, x plus y goes uh, to z plus w at some rate r, where x, y, z, and r are some chemical species typically, and r is the rate of the reaction, and this is the reaction that transforms one x and one y into one z and one w, or in a population of x's and y's, it will keep iterating in this reaction to, to change this population to those populations. So this is classically, in, in science, this is a phenomenological model, meaning that people do not try to invent new chemical reactions from scratch. They, they look what happens in the world and they write down the chemical reactions that seem to be happening in the world. So pure phenomenology. Um, but it's also, uh, in a sense, the chemical reaction also in a sense the programming language because there, there is uh, something encoded into the genome that somehow causes chemical reactions to happen in a cell. So the picture in a sense of programming language, which is encoded into the genome, and the genome produced this uh, unbounded richness of behavior from this finite uh, program, which is found into the genome. So in, in a sense, it's a programming language. It's also a mathematical structure uh, of chemical reaction network, which has been rediscovered in many forms, uh, various names like vector vision systems, battery nets, Free languages, population protocol. These are all names of things which are very, very similar, and they're all very, very similar to chemical reactions. But so, in uh, in in summary, the chemical reaction networks are a description of mechanism. In a sense, it reacts by instructions of you know, how things uh, move step by step. So, I describe mechanism instruction interactions rather than behavior, which are characterized by equations or approximations. Um, which you can uh, derive uh, from, from the reactions as well. So the, the two things are connected, but they're distinct. So to, to explain uh, uh, how this uh, chemical programming language is going to work for us, I'm going to uh, start with a story about uh, uh, 100 years of chemical infinite loops in chemistry, uh, meaning chemical oscillations. 
Um, so this, you know, 2020 has not been a great year for biology, but 1920, 100 years ago, was a great year for biology. Uh, because uh, before that year, chemists did not believe that chemists, chemists could oscillate. They thought that, you know, whenever you mix chemicals together, they would react a little bit, but then it would die out and stop. Uh, while, while biology, of course, is oscillating their you know, day and night cycles and so on, seasonal cycles, uh, cells keep dividing apparently without without ever stopping. So um, so there was a big distinction between things that happen in chemistry, which always terminated, and things that happen in biology, which uh, potentially never terminated. But in, in 1920, Locke discovered this uh, system of differential equations, which was a surprise to him, which uh, characterized a, a, a chemical behavior, chemical reactions. And this uh, system of two, two differential equations, he showed that it actually can oscillate indefinitely. So this is a big surprise for him and for many other people, um, because this uh, differential equation can be in terms of chemical reaction or at least in a second. And so in 1920, we had the first retrograde proof of chemical oscillations. In 1921, just one year later, it so happens that the guy accidentally discovered a chemical oscillator, but they cannot believe that that happened. So he was forgotten for 37 years um, that he had discovered that. Uh, in one and in 26, uh, Volterra independently rediscovered the same differential equations, but his motivation was very biological, was to price system, so it gave it a nice uh, biological motivation for the long uh, equations. And we had to wait until 58, uh, 37 years later, when the other accident also later was discovered, but this one came by famous, and now everybody knows about this one now. And so people started studying these uh, chemical oscillators uh, in great detail. In 1963, Lawrence uh, discovered that not only you can oscillate in chemistry, you can also produce scalded oscillations. This is another big surprise. Um, and the very first uh, oscillator, which was actually designed, chemical oscillator, which was actually designed, not discovered accidentally, was only in 1981. In 2005, people were able to produce uh, uh, oscillation also proteins in, in a test tube, you just one or three proteins or nothing else. Uh, and uh, in 2017, people have uh, actually managed to build uh, an oscillator made, uh, made exclusively of DNA molecules. So, so this is to tell you that even very simple chemical systems of two equations uh, can have a very long, complicated, and interesting story. Uh, and, and so there is a lot of depth in this, uh, in this uh, simple set of equations. Um, now, as I was saying before, uh, equations and chemical reactions are connected. So I want to explain a little bit the connection between the two. So let's start with the Locker differential equation, which I didn't explain to you, but they, they look like this. Well, uh, it so happens that uh, there is a procedure, systematic procedure, that given a set of differential equations allows to derive an equivalent SN set of chemical reaction. So we go from this. Uh, uh, equation that Voltaire, for Voltaire, they meant the interaction between play and vectors. And we can automatically extract these four reactions. And what they say, now we can understand in more analytically what this, what this equation say. They say that uh, first, x1 is the prey and x2 is the vector. So x1 uh, reproduces, so the prey reproduces uh, automatically. Uh, the second reaction says when a prey is vector, uh, the prey disappears, so somehow the predator uh, kills it. Uh, again, when a prey meets a predator, uh, the predator doubles, so the predator is reduced because of the presence of the prey. The final reaction is that if, if the predator doesn't, doesn't find a prey soon enough, it will, it will, die, it will die out. So these are uh, basically a, a system mechanistic interpretation of these equations. And the, the, the transition is, is uh, automatic. Uh, basically, each monomial of this differential equation produces some reactions. So the polynomial and this polynomial of the system, you get four reactions and you can now interpret them fairly easily. However, you may notice there is something strange in these two reactions here. They both start with x1 and x2, but they both talk about predator and prey meeting uh, with each other. But then one says that the, that the prey dies out, and the other says that the predator increases and seems to be disconnected, right? So in fact, in, in fact, you would like to have a description of what happens in actual interaction of prey and predator. So you might want to have a, a, a reaction in terms that looks like this. This reaction says, when a prey meets the predator, the prey disappears on the right hand side, so it has been eaten, presumably. While the predator, at the same time, the same reaction does. So the predator somehow reproduces 
to this interaction. And so you may be tempted to take these two reactions that seem to be disconnected and replace it with a single reaction, which seems to talk about the interaction, actually interaction parameter. And this way we obtain a new uh, algorithm, which has the, the other, the first and the, and the final reaction are still there. And now we have this new reaction in the middle, which will replace all these two reactions there. And the question now, is this algorithm uh, the same as the, as the old one? Or do, do, do we change the, the behavior of the algorithm? Well, we can check that by um, computing the differential equations that uh, you can compute out of the alternative reaction by the low mass action of chemistry. So the same here, the same way here, up here we could have taken these reactions and apply the low mass action and recover the different equation we started from. And similarly here, we can look what kind of differential equation come out of this uh, uh, new algorithm. And what we get is exactly the same differential equation we started from, except that we had to identify um, a2 and b1. So these two rates, the distinct rates here, since we have merged into a single reaction, you have to make it into a single rate. But under this uh, equivalent of rates, a2 equal b1, then this algorithm is identical to the one, the same behavior, the same equations. So, so this is to illustrate the point that uh, there can be multiple algorithms in multiple chemical reaction networks for the same behavior, meaning the same set of differential equations. So in this sense, uh, chemical reaction networks are programs. They can have multiple programs for the same behavior. And the, the differential equations support the notion of program, program equivalence between the, these algorithms. So, um, oops. Uh, moreover, uh, the example here was local pair, but in fact, you can do that, uh, that kind of uh, transformation from equation to reactions for basically any uh, dynamical system. A dynamical system means something characterized by differential equations. So, for example, we can take the canonical oscillators, have a local pair, take the canonical oscillator, which is a sine, sine and cosine functions. So, this uh, differential equation system here um, characterized as, as for solutions as sine and cosine. So the derivative of sine is cosine, the derivative of cosine is minus sine. And if you uh, simulate this differential equation, you get the, the cosine cosine oscillation. So now suppose that I want to take this uh, system and get an equivalent uh, chemical reaction network that does the same thing. But it's a big problem because sine and cosine go negative and chemical concentrations can not go negative. So we have a big problem here. But what we can do is to exchange the variables and replace each uh, uh, variable, which could be negative or positive, with the difference of two positive variables. So systematically replace S with a plus, 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 minus, and replace T with C plus, C minus. And by doing this, we can obtain a system of four differential equations for S plus, S minus, C plus, C minus. And uh, I'm not telling you how, how I got this, but I can check that it's correct because I can, I can since the differential equation is linear, so I can subtract left and side, right hand side of these equations, the plus and minus. And so I get the best subtraction, I get these two differential equations. And by simple change of variable, the same which is here, we can see these are identical to the old differential equations. So this means that the solutions of this uh, differential equations here, which are set up, uh, are the same solution as the original system if you consider the difference of variables. So now <clears> that we have uh, a system of differential equations where everything is positive, we can apply the transformation to uh, chemical reactions again, this mysterious process that original nominal produces a reaction. So now we have four nominals to get four reactions. And again, we can check that this uh, produces the same differential equation, which is true. So we can, we can check this is correct as well. And as a first step, uh, we're going to go from here to, to actual molecules. But before we go do that, let me summarize this process. We can do that for any dynamical system. By this, I mean any, any set of differential equations, which include not just only polynomials, but also trigonometry, exponentials, fractions, and then versus all this stuff to be on the right hand side of the differential equations. Those are called elementary, they're not elementary at all, they're called elementary of these. Uh, so any elementary of these uh, can be, again, algorithmic transformed into a polynomial of the, the, of the system, which only has uh, polynomials on the right hand side. So this is introducing more variables, but the, you simplify from having you know, exponentials for it than, and science and cosine, right? So I can remove them all and you get an exact uh, equivalent, uh, equivalent to these exact, the same exact solutions using more variables. 
So, so you, I didn't, know, didn't need to do that here because this is already part of the system, but I can take any contrary basically body system and approximate to program that system. Then the second step is to remove the negative variables by splitting, splitting them. Uh, the second step is to check that you can apply this dependence transformation, which in this case it's always possible when you, when you start from a positive, positive system. And then we can apply this transformation from uh, you know, these two chemical reactions. And now finally, we can uh, map uh, chemical reactions to actual physical models that, that when executed in a test tube, it has the same behavior as the original system. So this is basically called this compiling uh, systems to molecules, a molecule that will behave uh, in a certain sense uh, uh, exactly like the original dynamical system. So let me, um, um, so in, in this sense, uh, chemistry is also a formal language that you can use to, to implement any dynamical system with real DNA molecules, going through this intermediate language of, of chemistry. Um, and this is uh, uh, the final step is explained in this paper here that tells you how to start from a, any collection of abstract chemical reactions on X, Y, Z, and Ws, and so on. And systematically from it, from it uh, compile specially designed DNA molecules that implement those uh, chemical reactions. Uh, so uh, what we'll do now, I will uh, give you a little summary of how that works. How can you go from chemi from abstract chemical reactions? So remember, these are just the chemical reactions about X, Y, Z, and W. They're not specific chemicals. They're just reactions about some species that we don't really know what they are. But we can engineer those species so that they will obey those reactions. So we can do that with DNA because DNA is, a, in a sense, a programmable uh, uh, kind of programmable molecules. We can, we can choose the, the sequences of bases that allows us to engineer specific molecule, molecule specific properties. So if this is a, a, a DNA sequence, a single strand DNA sequence, that you have this single uh, nuclei, CTG, CTG, and so on, um, we, we call a domain <coughs> of a DNA strand. A, do, a domain is a subsequence of the, the sequence such that if you talk about different domains, X, Y, and Z, then they're called domains if the sequences are uh, orthogonal or independent, which means that these uh, sequences of uh, independent domains do not stick to each other. They basically, uh, they, they repel each other in a sense. So they're orthogonal. And you can always do that. You can always design a collection of sequences of DNA that do not uh, uh, you know, uh, interfere with each other in the sense do not stick to each other when you don't want them to. So then the first step is to go from actual you know, nuclear sequences to, to domains. And now we, now we can think about just domains abstractly without wondering, uh, worrying about what the actual sequences of, of the domains. We can, we can decide that later. Um, so uh, once we have this notion of uh, domain-based uh, DNA sequences, then we can do uh, design of, uh, <clears throat> of DNA molecules uh, that will execute some specific chemical reactions. Uh, so in this, uh, this is one of the possible schemes. There are many, many different DNA schemes or implementing chemical reactions. This is just one of them, uh, but it's based on uh, single strands and double strands. So these are kind of natural conformations of DNA. So these are single strands and we, we use them for inputs and outputs. So an input will be, uh, the, the X input will be represented as a, as a domain which represents the, the X domain and to hold T, which will be used to initiate a reaction. Uh, with, a, with a gate, which is going to be the double strand here. So this is the input x, the input y, and we want to and we want to go from input x and y to output z and w. So at the end, we need to get out of this uh, uh, construction here a, a strand which looks like t z and one that looks like t w. So now there's a whole set of sequence of steps here, where the input gets down to this gate here, which is a double stranded sequence, and the binding of this uh, input to this gate. Uh, cause this little segment here to detach because uh, this is double strand DNA, but the bottom strand is continuous. So the bottom strand is uh, continuous here. The top strand is interrupted where these arrows are. So there are interruptions of nicks in the top strand here, you know, or, or the, head, the arrow heads are. So when the input strands enter here, can displace this, uh, this uh, strand here and kick it out because there's an interruption here. And this opens up a new to hole where the next input can fit. So this is uh, one half of the uh, construction. This takes the inputs and then basically sends the signal that says, okay, I've, I've seen all the inputs. 
and then the second half that is activated by the signal, the set of signal, the input, and the second half basically uh, kicks out all the outputs one after the other. I will show you a little movie how this works uh, to give you an idea. There's some garbage collection as well to get rid of uh, whatever is, is left. But this is a little Look, movie that okay, shows um, it works. So can, yeah. can I just interrupt for a little bit? I think uh, we are having some problems with your sound on your site. Okay, so uh, I'm wondering uh, if it might be your, your, your microphone, because uh, it, it, the, the sound is, is not uh, good. So, uh, and I've checked with other people. So, so, peop so it seems is, uh, is not a problem with the connection on our side. So well, I'm using I'm using the micro. Can you hear me now? Now is much better. I think now is much clearer. Okay. I don't know what to do. I don't know. Uh, it, I'm just using the laptop for the for the sound. Okay. Okay. Right. So just using the laptop. Okay. So maybe yeah. you, you can try to continue. Yeah. But I, I just okay. wanted to alert you that we were having some sound problems. Okay. Uh, okay. Let me know if you have problems uh, again. Okay. 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 So, yeah. So let's continue. Um, so what I wanted to uh, basically what I showed what I, uh, I showed before was just a, a complicated uh, DNA structure, and this is a movie that shows you how it's supposed to work. So the, the inputs come. There is this uh, shuffling of segments on on the top strands of the DNA, and at the end of this shuffling, uh, a TZ appears, which was coming from here. So it's, it's come this, that used to be here, and as a shuffle, this gets kicked out and it becomes the output for the process. So, uh, so this way you can take any chemical reactions like this one, or one with multiple outputs, and by this uh, kind of map, you can go from, from input uh, sequences to output sequences and implement in this sense chemical reactions. So this can be done uh, also in the lab. So we take uh, for example, these three, oops, these three reactions here, which are a specific algorithm called approximate majority, implemented by these three reactions. And we can compile each action to these uh, DNA structures with uh, you know, double stranded with interaction on the top, and these are the inputs and so on. So, this is the first reaction, the second reaction, the third reaction. And then we can mix all this up into a test tube, and, uh, and then we can look by fluorescence happens uh, to the outputs, and we can check that this actually works correctly. So, uh, so this is to illustrate the fact that now we can actually go from, uh, in a sense, abstract chemical programs to real uh, uh, molecular interactions in a test tube uniformly for any set of chemical reaction, for any, for any set of chemical reactions. We can compile them that way. Okay, so this, uh, so this first part was about uh, basically modeling how to how to model uh, hello system. luca yeah sorry, sorry sorry to interrupt again um so uh we were discussing and uh one observation uh is is apparently your sound gets worse when you start moving your mouse i don't know for oh. whatever reason <laughs> okay <clears throat> let me good let me disconnect the mouse i, I will and i will use the um uh, the trackpad is this better okay yeah, I can hear you and your mouse is moving. <laughs> okay, great, great. <laughs> All right. Okay, okay. so <clears throat> please continue. Know, Sorry for the interruption. Yeah. Okay, that was a good, that was a good breaking point anyway, because uh, so the first part was about uh, modeling. So it was about uh, uh, using uh, differential equations or chemical reaction networks or whatever to model some situations that may happen in, 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 in reality. Um, and I was talking about protocols for testing testing those models. So again, we want we want to do automation, right? We want to automate the whole process of uh, scientific discovery. Uh, so what is a protocol? A protocol is a set of steps uh, that are used to to direct a lab machine lab machinery or or maybe even people to execute a certain procedure to get something done. So it's a protocol with a set of steps. Um, and um, while well, a model is a set of equations to predict uh, the results of the, of the experiment. And uh, traditionally, protocols, they know nothing about models. If you read the protocol, it tells you what step to make, but it doesn't tell you what you're testing. Okay. And conversely, modeling, models know nothing about protocols. Models tell you equations or reactions, but they don't, do not tell you what kind of steps you're supposed to uh, follow to test, to test the model. 
but of course they both talk about the same physical system so they should be somehow connected to each other and we want to make this connection explicit because otherwise we have uh, uh, problems with reproducing uh, experiments um, and also not only experiments are hard to reproduce even models are hard to reproduce because they usually they're not written down very precisely or they start, start to find out uh, what they are so we want all these things to, to be to be well, well structured and, and, and described so that we can reproduce them um, so an, an example of a protocol to make a, a contrast so a protocol um, uh, it, it is, a, is a DNA protocol like the one we would be using for those DNA experiments so you have a, here a test tube which contains this strand here two three and another test tube that contains this strand here one two three four and the protocol says well take these two test tubes and mix them um, and when you mix them then hopefully you will get this uh, uh, test tube containing this uh, strand where two three got uh, you know attached to the top here and made this double strand one two three four then now you have this test tube with this uh, stuff inside now you take another test tube with this strand one two inside and you mix this with the first one this will be providing the first input to the to the gate and then we have another test tube with three four inside the test tube which will be the second input you mix it to the other test tube and now provide second input and that's the end of the protocol and then you would uh, use some uh, some way of uh, verifying or uh, reading out the, the results of the experiment, like fluorescence, for example. So that's the protocol, just the sequence of steps of mixing things together. Well, this is the corresponding model that tells you if you have this strand and that strand, then there will be a chemical reaction that will compose them this way. And if you have this strand and that strand, there will be a chemical reaction, also reversible, that will produce that structure. And this structure, when it finds that strand, will produce will have this reaction that produces that structure and so on. So this is the model, which is the chemical reaction network. Uh, While well, this was the protocol, which is a set of steps for the same thing. So to describe the two things together, we need we need we need uh, basically a language to combine combine the protocol and, and the model into a single description. And this now becomes a script that describes the steps of the protocol, but also contains uh, information about uh, the uh, the structures and the chemical reactions that should enter into into the whole enterprise uh, so what is this uh, language of uh, of integrated descriptions well first of all there are some uh, uh, so the fundamental notion is, is a sample which is a sample is basically a test tube so a sample is something is a container which has a volume a temperature and some concentrations for the chemical species inside inside the sample and so this is a language that manipulates samples so there will be sample variables and there will be initial conditions for the samples and some local variable. And these are the operations. You can mix two samples. Uh, you can split a sample into two parts, X and Y, by some proportion. Uh, you can equilibrate a sample, which means you can just let it sit so that the chemical reactions can execute for some amount of time T, which is specified here. And then you can dispose the sample, you can throw it away. Uh, so, and so this together with uh, the chemical reactions, which are in, in, the, in, in the actual model, this is the entire thing. So this very simple, the so-called liquid handling operations, manipulating samples, plus the chemical reactions you have uh, in the background. Uh, now this, uh, this uh, language of uh, sample manipulation has a semantics. So you can give a, almost like a, a standard traditional denotational semantics. So uh, P is a protocol and brackets P will be the denotation of the protocol. So what the protocols actually does. And the, the semantics here is defined in such a way that the, the denotation of a protocol is the final sample that comes out at the end of the protocol. So running a protocol, its meaning is the, is the, the, output, the final output of that protocol, the final sample that you get out of the protocol. So based on this idea, we can give uh, uh, fairly simple rules about what happens in each situation. So without going to the, all the details, but let's look at the mix. So mix, uh, there are two sub protocols, one protocol to prepare one sample, P1, and one protocol to prepare another sample. Uh, well, uh, so the samples are here, X0 are the concentrations, V are the volume, the T are the temperatures. So if you execute P1, you will get the first sample, uh, X1, V1, T1. If you execute P2, you get the second sample, X2, V2, T2. And then we need to mix them. So to mix it, we need to specify the, the new concentrations, the new volumes, and new temperature of the of, of the mix of the mixed uh, sample. So the well, the, the volumes will be the sum of the volumes. Uh, the temperature of the new sample will be a, a weighted average of the temperature of the individual sample weighted by the volumes. 
and the concentration are also averaged out and weighted by the volume. So, so now this tells you what is the uh, what is the result, uh, the sum, what is the sample, which is the result of mixing P1 and P2. And similarly for all the other operations for split and, and so on, equilibrate uh, is a bit different. So equilibrate uh, needs to take an, an input sample and let it sit for a while so the reactions can execute and then looks uh, decide what the output sample should be. So what is the, how do you compute the output sample of an equilibrate? Well, you compute it by integrating the differential equations. So this uh, formula here tells you given the, the initial uh, concentrations into the, uh, the, the input sample, you integrate the differential equation that come from the chemical reaction network, and that would, would tell you what would be the concentration at certain after after time t. And so that would be the result of, of this equilibrate, the sample, which is the result of the product. Okay, so this is uh, fairly simple for uh, deterministic semantics. Um, you can also uh, have stochastic semantics, meaning that, for example, splitting a sample into two may have an uncertainty in the volume of the, of the, of the resulting parts. And equilibrating may have an uncertainty about the, the exact time that you allow it to equilibrate. You may be a bit, a bit off. Uh, reactions also have uncertainty about the actual rates that chemicals actually have. There are also molecular noise, so lots of stochastic uncertainty there. So if you consider all these uncertainties together, you end up with a mathematical model where instead of being a simple, you know, um, uh, dimensional semantic for deterministic of these, becomes a hybrid system. So you will have uh, 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 you will be iterating uh, uh, deterministic evolution of chemical samples when they equilibrate, but then you'll have stochastic jumps from one state to another when you split or mix uh, 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 samples. And so the whole framework, however, you can look at it as a, an instance of piecewise deterministic microprocessing, which are a very well studied uh, hybrid system method. And so you could use, for example, uh, tools and techniques in this area to, to study the stochastic version of this. Uh, of this uh, uh, sample manipulation languages. Uh, and so you can use uh, you can do some kind of stochastic analysis based on this uh, stochastic semantics. So what I want to start showing now is the uh, uh, a, a physical implement a physical realization of this uh, of these ideas in terms of, a, of an app, which is the uh, Kimika app, which you can find in all, all the app stores. So you can just go there, search for Kimika, and you can install it. And uh, so let me see if I can start it here. Uh, so, hope you see that. Uh, so, okay. So I'll get I'll get back to that in a second. Um, so the main features of this uh, of this app it has it has uh, it it, can, it, it handles species and reactions, so which are characterized by initial values and rates. Uh, it handles samples, which are compartments, uh, and which have this uh, protocol manipulation uh, operations for samples. So samples isolate reactions in a compartment until you mix them. Uh, there is uh, kinetics, so simulation, uh, deterministic ODEs or stochastic ODEs from the linear noise approximation, which are supported in the, in, in the app. And there are digital microfluidics for, for chemical protocols, which I'll describe in a second. But on top, on top of all these uh, fundamentals, there are programming abstractions. So there are, there are ways of assembling models and protocols uh, programmatically, programmatically with a rich, uh, rich programming language. Um, so here's an example of a, of a Kimika uh, script, uh, going back to the Lotka Voltaire, Voltaire example. So the first two lines here, uh, they, um, uh, they extract uh, some uh, initial, initial um, conditions from some random variables. So you will have random initial conditions. These two lines here initialize two species, X1 and X2, the and the predator, with those initial conditions. And these three lines are just chemical reactions. These are, these are the rates for the chemical reactions. And then we say equilibrate for 40, meaning uh, simulate the system for 40 seconds. Um, uh, so by the way, this, uh, these diagrams, which we will see here, are a graphical representation of the chemical reaction network. But instead of showing as a graph, it's shown as a, what I call a reaction score. So a reaction A plus B goes C plus D. Uh, the species is like a musical score. The species are the, the lines of the score. So A, B, C, and D are the lines. And the reactions are this uh, interconnection between the lines of the score, like, like, the, like musical chords uh, between, the, the, between the score lines. So this represents the A plus B goes C plus D reaction. And these are similar special cases uh, of, of other reactions. And, uh, and there is a special situation when you have a catalyst. So a catalyst is a species that participates in a reaction but is not changed by it. So A 
is uh, uh, basically A is catalyzing the transformation of B into C. So this is represented as a, as a special link A, uh, which connects uh, to the trans transition from B to C, meaning that A helps B become C. And again, there are some special cases. Um, so, so going back to the, uh, uh, to the language, so models are generated by programs. So there is a functional language that allows to, to, to generate models and, and protocols. There are rich data types, uh, number of species, so species and networks and, and time flows, uh, so trajectories, they're all data, data types in this programming language uh, in addition to numbers, functions, and lists, which are standard. Uh, flows are composable functions of time, uh, which are used uh, uh, in rates for plotting and uh, for observing results of, of uh, experiments, but again, they're still basically uh, trajectories. Uh, and the abstractions uh, are functional programming, first of all, but with monadic effects for producing uh, new species and reactions and for liquid handling. And it's a nominal language, meaning that uh, uh, chemical species are lexically scoped. They are not strings, they're actual you know, they're, uh, program names that are handled correctly. So let me show you an example of uh, programming so I'm doing some non-trivial pro programming combined with chemistry in this language. So this is a function uh, called uh, predatorial. And the idea is to produce a uh, lot Volterra again, but instead of just one copy of lot Volterra, we want to have n copies, uh, one on top of the other, such that uh, the prey of one level is the predator for the next level. So it's a stack of predator prey, each feeding on the, feeding on the next uh, level down. So this basically uh, gives you a way of producing a chemical reaction network as a result of this function, whose size uh, is not fixed. The size is, is depends on a parameter to this program. So it's, it's a, it's a uh, parametric uh, network, even in its size. So predatorial takes a number n, which is the number of stacks of predators that we want to have. And if n is equal to zero, then in this case, there are no predators, they just, they just prey. And the prey has some initial concentration, and it's just one reaction that says the prey reproduces. And these two lines say is report prey means we want to plot the prey. So report means plot. And then we return the prey species as a result of this function. Now, if n is greater than zero, then there will be a predator. And the prey for this predator will be the result of predatory of n minus one, so the, 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 the next iteration down. And now we have the two reactions from Lotka Volterra that says the prey and the predator. And you know, the predator is the prey and the predator dies if it doesn't find the prey. And again, we want to plot the predator and again, we want to return the predator as the result of the function. So finally, we, call, we can call predator predatorial like over five and then we'll produce a stack of uh, predator prey. So let me start showing you how this works in the um, app. So, oops. So, so this is the local Terra. So this is the script you've seen before. If I run uh, the, uh, uh, this is the play button, so which will run the simulation. And so this runs the, the oscillation. And if I run it multiple times, since I, I have random initial conditions, it will show different uh, effects of the local Terra oscillator. And here we, do, we have a whole set of uh, uh, examples. One of them is the predatorial. So this is what, what we just saw. So if I run this example, then we get this uh, 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 complex situation where this, the prey gets uh, hit on a lot, so oscillates a lot. I can, we can change this to, instead of five, make nine. And then we have uh, uh, more uh, uh, predators and prey in, in a stack, or you can make it three and you can see um, how many, uh, we can get a simpler situation. So, so this is the idea uh, for uh, the programmability of the, of the system. Notice that there's a freely intermixing uh, control flow in the standard sense functions with uh, uh, chemical reactions in natural syntax, nothing, nothing funny there. So let's go back to here. Um, so, so that was the, uh, how the chemistry is handled in the, in the chemic app. What about the protocols? Well, um, again, protocols are based on the notion there are samples, meaning test tubes, and there are protocol operations for liquid handling, meaning mixing and splitting and so on. Um, and uh, here's an example of sample manipulation. There is a, um, a species C, which is a global species, so it can be used in multiple samples. A sample has this syntax. It has a name, 
it has a volume and a temperature. And then uh, we put the species A in, in sample big A, and we, and we put uh, some amount of species C in sample big A. And then there is a reaction connecting A and C in this sample. This is, then there's a, a second sample B. Again, it's, it has a volume and a temperature. It has uh, some local species, some amount of the global species, and again, a reaction connecting the two. Um, and uh, so samples, they have volume and temperature because uh, uh, reactions may be temperature dependent. And the species can initialize in a way which is volume dependent. If it, uh, once you specify it in grams, then the, the concentration will depend on the volume of the, of the sample. So, so this is why this is all connected. And the liquid sample operations is the actual syntax in the language. You can mix uh, uh, B and C into A, or you can split uh, A into B and C by some proportion. Or you can equilibrate uh, B for three seconds, obtaining a new sample A, or we can dispose of C and have some other primitives and so on. Uh, so if we uh, now run this, uh, uh, the, these two sample A and B with some uh, uh, mix and random mix and split operations, let me show you what happens. Um, so if we go to mix and split. Now here there are uh, three equilibrate instructions for the first sample, second sample, and after all the mixing. Uh, so if I run this, it uh, runs three simulations. So the first time we simulate sample A, what, this is what happens inside sample A, and this it basically pauses here. Then if I unpause, uh, it will simulate sample B. That's what happens inside sample B. And I, the, the next sample is the mixture of basically A and B. So the, the reactions start interacting with each other. Uh, and, uh, and now we get, when we mix the whole thing, now we get an oscillation. Um, and this is uh, with these three reactions here. And it's uh, in sample E, which is uh, the final one here. So this is how uh, samples work. Um, and, uh, we're doing these uh, three simulations. Um, and this is an example of an actual protocol from a, from a database. You can, this is a real uh, chemical protocol and you can look at this uh, sequence of steps and basically translate them into the, uh, the Kimika uh, protocol language uh, pretty much uh, uh, all right. Uh, this is an I will not go through this, but it's an example of a recursive protocol because you also, you also want protocols to be recursive. So serial dilution is a dilution, iterated dilution. So you can do this with a recursive uh, protocol that keeps uh, splitting and splitting and splitting and splitting uh, your samples to dilute something. Um, so, but now I want to go back to the question of execution. So we've seen that uh, we can execute chemical reactions with DNA molecules, with actual physical DNA molecules. What about executing protocols? How, how we execute them um, in a kind of a, a physical way? Uh, well, uh, this can be done by digital microfluidics. Uh, this is a general programmable platform to execute uh, uh, the main liquid handling operations. And so to close the cycle, you can have a generation of molecules from DNA and then microfluidic operation of those molecules uh, again from, from which is again programmable. So let me show you how microfluidics, digital microfluidics works. So there is a, a substrate, which is just a rectangular substrate of e electrodes. And there are droplets that will contain your chemicals that can be moved by electrical uh, pulse pulses uh, over this uh, array. This is just a rectangular array is uh, completely programmable. You can decide where to send your droplet uh, in, in, this, in this situation. And uh, uh, you can do two things. You can, you can do, um, I'll start this. Yeah, you can you can uh, uh, extrude droplets and move them around and cause them to to merge by putting them into the same pad. You can also cause them to split by pulling them electrically apart. So so splitting is also possible, and you can do this pretty fast. This is a this is a speed test, so you can see that in real time these uh, droplets can can move pretty quickly. So this is digital microfluidics, uh, completely programmable, completely general mixing and splitting of things. Um, and uh, this is uh, implemented as a simulator in, uh, in Kimika. Uh, so if we go back to the same example here, but suppose now I activate the macrofluidic simulator, which is here, and I run this again. Uh, now, not only we do the chemical simulations up here, we also do the protocol simulations down here. This is the first step uh, where this, uh, this A1, uh, this A sample, A1 sample had to be equilibrated. So it, it went from this uh, cold region 
where things are frozen, so reactions do not happen. We moved it to a, to a warm region where reactions can happen. And when it was there, uh, the, the simulation of the uh, sample happened. And now we are paused back in here. So if I now go to the second step, it will try to do the second simulation. So it will move things to the warm area and then uh, move it back because they've done the simulation. But now there's all this splitting and mixing that happens here with, with the droplets. And uh, once it's finished with uh, mixing and splitting, then we are back into the, the third uh, simulation equilibrate. And if I run this, then again, it will go to the, to the warm area, uh, run the simulation there, and then go back and eventually do the dispose, uh, which uh, throws it away. Okay, so uh, back to the slides. So, uh, so again, to summarize, uh, this is a way of uh, ex uh, representing in, in the same uh, context, both the model and the protocol. Uh, they are both uh, implicit in, in, in this script here. From this script here, you can extract the protocol, for example, as a graph. Uh, this can be done in one of the, uh, in one of the apps. Uh, and uh, this will tell you, for example, that if you start with sample A and sample B, you can split, uh, you can equilibrate A into A1, then you split A1 into two parts. So this graph tells you the protocol, the, the, the sequence of steps of mixing and splitting that you're supposed to be doing in the lab. And this you can extract from, from here by just looking at the right parts. But at the same time, you can also extract the, the chemical reaction networks from here to run the simulations uh, uh, of, of the ODEs. And uh, in, uh, in this case, for example, this one down here is the final state of sample E, which has some chemical concentrations and chemical reactions and some differential equations for the kinetics of this, the final sample. Now the full story, so you can, you can extract uh, the, the protocol, you can extract the final, uh, final state, but you can also look at the entire progress of the, of the, of the protocol. So if you want to look at all the details, you can, you can see that uh, the sequence of states, well, initially you have A and B uh, samples, then A became A1, so you have the state BA1. So B, B became B1, so you have the state A1, B1. So for each state, you have the concentrations and reactions for each of the, for each of the samples. So you can extract all those and this uh, long uh, uh, script here, it details uh, at each state of these uh, protocols, what is the situation in, this, in each sample and how, and how, the, and how the, the transition from one state to another. So this is the, finally the full picture of the, of the protocol and the, and the chemistry together. So at this point I can, I can conclude. Uh, so we've seen the notion of uh, integrated modeling uh, of chemical reaction network and protocols and how the Chemica app supports it. And this is, uh, uh, the, the idea is that uh, in the future, we would like to have this kind of closed loop modeling and experimentation and analysis. So we would like to have a, a, a setup where you can uh, uh, write a script, the script will determine how certain molecules like DNA molecule are synthesized on the fly uh, on, your, on your desktop. And then the synthesized molecules are pushed into a microfluidic device to, to do the mixing and splitting. And then the microfluidic device will spit them out and they will go into some other apparatus that uh, reads out uh, what happened in, into, into the chemical solutions. And, that, and this can be read out by the program, which can decide what to do next, like which other molecules to synthesize and, and how to go back into, into the loop. So this is closed loop modeling, experimentation analysis. And you can, have, uh, uh, you can imagine doing this automatically and, and changing conditions to, to investigate uh, uh, situations by varying parameters on the fly. So this is what uh, we hope in the future will uh, uh, enable you know, complete lab automation and allow us, allow us to scale up the scientific method to, to the situation where we need to do millions and millions of experiments to, to really understand what happens in, in some physical system. Okay, so I can stop here. Thank you very much. I hope the, the sound was okay until now. Uh, thank you very much. I, I think the sound definitely improved. Uh, okay, I will not. I will not use that mouse again. <laughs> <laughs> very good. Um, so, any, any questions for from uh, the audience? So you can, uh, if you have questions, you can turn on your uh, sound and uh, make a question. So I don't know if I can see. Yeah. So I, 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 maybe I can start with one. Yeah. So I, I'm very curious about, uh, so you, you're basically in Chemica, you're, you're developing a, a 
programming language. And, you know, one, one of the big challenges always with programming languages is to get your users to use them. <laughs> in, in your case, your users are, I suppose, chemics, chemists and biologists and so on. So um, how is Chemica being received by the community in that field? So, so do, do you have some input? Uh, well, this is, this is fairly new. So at the moment, most of the students using, using the, uh, the tool. Um, <clears throat> and uh, um, well, the, it's, um, there, are, you know, there are lots of uh, uh, startups that work on auto, uh, lab automation. Um, and there are lots of you know, programming languages, one kind or another, for automating lab equipment, um, but they're all uh, kind of uh, um, uh, specific to specific, uh, uh, to specific uh, lab equipment. So each, each uh, piece of lab equipment will have its own, you know, uh, application interface and programming, maybe graphical programming language. Certainly it has a computer that comes with it. So the whole, the whole thing is all fragmented. So um, to, uh, and people, of course, biologists uh, and chemists use those things in the lab. And they have to learn for each piece of equipment how to program it and how to use it. So we would, we would like to have a situation where we can more systematically program multiple pieces of equipment all together. And there are startups that, for, for example, try to collect the proprietary um, uh, protocols for this piece of equipment and, and, and try device drivers for them that will look then eventually like almost like an operating system. And then once you have an operating system, then maybe you can have programming language that, that you know, compiles to it. So this is going to be a long process. And what I've been trying to do here is to give an idea of what this might look like in the future. Uh, so, uh, so you want to have you know, a powerful programming language. You don't want to have lots of you know, weird scripting. Uh, and you want to have a, a general, uh, general lab equipment. You don't want to have uh, some very specific robots that cannot be programmed very easily. You want to have something like visual microfluidics, which is very general and, and powerful. Uh, even though, it's, again, it is not uh, very well developed uh, yet, but, but uh, we need this kind of equipment. And so basically, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an idea, an attempt to give you an idea of what the future might look like. And at the moment, they're basically students uh, using it for, for projects. Um, and, and of course, they have lots of other tools that they can use as well. Okay, okay, thank you. So any other questions from the audience? Mark, Mark. Um, so um, from a programming language design perspective, uh, what is that make what you are doing worth of being a language instead of like a library over Python or some other language with flexible enough syntax? Yeah, of course, that, that's, uh, that's an option. Uh, I decided to go for a language because uh, I, I like the notion of uh, having a natural chemical syntax. So if, you, if you want, uh, so this is the chemical reaction which are freely mixed inside the, the syntax of language. So they're uh, you know, there are, there are tricks, tricks you can play with various programming languages to achieve something similar. But I want to make sure that a chemist would, would recognize the chemical reactions exactly like they're used to see them. And so there was no uh, strange syntax in, in that. Um, and also because I want it to be uh, very functional. Um, uh, because, I mean, I've, I've used, uh, I've used um, I mean, there have been previous uh, attempts to, to, to design programming languages for uh, modular, modularizing chemistry. Uh, there are some nice PhD theses and there are some prototypes. And what has happened in practice seems that in, in practice, although the original ideas were quite nice in general, once people start to implement them and try to use them practically, they basically forget about the programming language and they, they do some hacks that uh, uh, cause things not to be modular any, anywhere, not to be composable anymore and so on. So I wanted to start from the programming language to make sure that, that part was done, was done nicely and, and, and flexibly. Um, and, 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 and that's how, that's how it happened. Okay, um, so any further questions? Any more questions from the audience? So maybe just a follow up to the earlier question will be, would it, would it be not easier if you were to, um, you know, come up with a DSL that can do this sort of chemical um, reactions. Uh, you mean domain specific, domain specific yeah. language? Yeah. Yeah. Well, some, this some... is this is a domain specific language. This is the I see, but you didn't yeah, build it on top of uh, existing, um, you know, general purpose language. Yeah, it, that, that's a that's a path you could take. 
uh, you could mm -hmm. you could use a uh, uh, Haskell or uh, whatever you like. Um, mm -hmm. I I wanted to have something well integrated with the simulation and uh, everything, so I decided. I mean, it didn't cost me much to do a parser, and now I have full control on the semantics uh, of, of the language. You know, you're com combining chemical reactions and and samples with the function execution. You know, there there are some issues there. Um, and for example, I wanted to have a very powerful uh, sub, uh, sub language of, uh, of time flows, of, of time wow. courses, of trajectories. So, so that, that is what appears inside the, uh, the rate brackets. And that requires a different kind of evaluation. So there are some issues that maybe are easier to, ta to tackle if you have full control of the syntax. Mm. I see. OK. But but certainly you you could go the other way. Yeah. So did you have a paper describing this current work? That's yeah, the one. There is a, there is a, yeah, there are there are two papers in uh, here. So there is a, a paper on CMSB 2018 describing the the um, liquid handling uh, protocol language. Okay. And there is a recent paper describing the the app. Uh, so. All right. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Um, so uh, we are a little bit over time already. So maybe we'll, what we can do is, I'll, if if anyone wants to ask one final voice question, we can do it now. And I remind everyone that there's also a Slack channel. I'm not sure if uh, Luca. Uh, uh, I'm you... sorry. I I I. I... Never use Slack. Wanted to okay. wanted me to create create an account or something. So. <laughs> all right, all right. No, no, no worries. Um, so then, uh, let's take one final question, if there is any. Okay. There is a question in the Zoom chat. Uh, a certain Alexander said, "You mentioned monadic effects. Could you please elaborate from Alexander?" Teach I'm sorry, I cannot uh, pronounce the surname. Yeah, so there, so there is an, is an output monad. So uh, the execution of a function also has a, an output stream uh, as an effect. And the output stream contains uh, a, the, the creation of new species, uh, the introduction of new reactions, and things like the, the, uh, the liquid handling instructions mix and split. So those are all imperative uh, uh, things that get put into the output stream. So, so when I run, uh, when I run the, uh, my predatorial example, um, there will be a result for that function that you can see in the, in the, you know, the textual output. In, in this case, it was a species. And also there will be the effect which is running the simulation. So that is the monadic effect on the side. Right. So. Uh, thank you very much again. Uh, I guess we can give you a virtual round of applause. Thank you. And uh, um, I think that's the end of the first invited uh, talk of Atlas. Okay, so I hope to see you all in the next session. <laughs>